Okay, I'm gonna get started. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's webinar, Conversations That Count Reading and Literacy Series, Session 3, sponsored by Developmental Pathways in Denver Academy. My name is Pam Christie at Peak Parent Center, and I will be monitoring the chat throughout the training. Before we get started, I'd like to go over a few items so you know how to participate in this evening's event. You will be muted for the first part of the presentation, so please use chat to ask questions. Then we will open it up for the conversation at the end. Closed captioning is um, going to be available at the bottom of your screen if you need that. And then if you could please put your child's grade level they are going into and the city you are joining from in the chat, we would greatly appreciate it. And it's my pleasure to introduce our presenter, Jessica Budin from Denver Academy. Thank you so much. Um, I'm honored to be here to speak with you all. Um, I am an instructional coach and a literacy specialist at Denver Academy. And I'm trying to move my screen, there we go. Um, this is me and my husband, who is also an educator at Denver Academy. He is the dean of the sixth grade and also runs our summer program. And these are our two little kiddos. We have a five and a half year old, Elliot is the oldest and our youngest is two years old and his name is Jacob. Um, Elliot is going into kindergarten next year. So he is very much in the emergent reader category right now. He is kind of recognizing all sounds and words and things around him and just wanting to know what everything says and what it means. And it's really fun. And of course, Jacob is doing the exact same thing, but has no idea what's going on. He's just copying his older brother. Um, so like I mentioned, I am um, a literacy specialist and instructional coach over at Denver Academy. Um, Denver Academy is a private school for diverse learners. It's grades first grade through second grade or through 12th grade, sorry. Um, it's located in Denver. We are a tuition-based private school. Um, and really we inspire and empower diverse learners through student-centered, differentiated and transformative education. And we really strongly believe in high expectations, high accountability and high support for both our students and teachers. I have this pretty incredible job at Denver Academy where I get to work half of my hours with teachers and mentor and coach our brand new teachers to our school and model lesson plans and support the teachers um, throughout the year. And then the other half of my job is I get to work one on one in small groups with kids and push into their classes and um, provide support for most of our lower um, our lowest level readers and writers. So. It's really a great, unique position to be in, and it's really wonderful to be able to work with both adults and um, students. So that's a little bit about me. Um, but now I wanna know a little bit about you. So I call this a do now, and we do this um, with our students as well as as part of our lesson plans. But in the chat bar or on a piece of paper in front of you, however you're most comfortable, I'd love for you to do a little reflecting. So you can write or draw or, or simply think if that's more comfortable for you about your road to reading. So what I'm really asking is kind of, here's some questions to ponder, they're on the screen there, but just kind of what was it like for you to learn to read? Do you remember learning to read? Was it hard? Does anything stand out from you? Maybe favorite books? And then even like, how does reading play a role in your life now? So I'm gonna give you a minute um, to kind of think about a couple minutes to think, reflect, write in the chat or just think about it. Give you another couple seconds to sort of gather your thoughts.
All right. Does anyone feel comfortable sharing? I see you guys wrote in the in the chat. But do any of you guys feel comfortable sharing what it was like to be a reader? What do you remember your road to reading being like? I can share. Um, I have always really loved reading and I was very shy and I'm an only child. So I spent all of my time reading and eventually I did um, an English bachelor's degree because <laughs> that was such a big part of my life. Thank you for sharing. Anne, do you have any, do you feel comfortable sharing at all? Sure. Yeah, I, I think I was, um, I, I picked up reading early and so, um, and then, and then I, I've re I read, I read a lot um, and at different points in my life, I read more or less depending on what I'm doing. But, um, and so that's been interesting for me as a parent because all of my kids, um, two of my kids are dyslexic and, and the third one just struggles with reading generally. And so it's just been an interesting path to have um, so many reading challenges after not really having any. Yeah, and everybody's roads look so different. And I find it really empowering as, as a parent and as an educator to really think about what reading was like for me um, and what my road to reading really was like. Um, I'll share for a little, a minute about myself. My road to reading was really easy. I found it, I loved reading. I uh, believe I was taught in what we would call the whole language philosophy of reading. Um, where really we don't talk about breaking words apart into sounds and syllables. Whole language is more about the relationship between um, the context of what the words mean. And so it was really like exposure, like look at words, recognize what it means, and you'll be able to like plug and play. It seems silly now to think about it. And this is a pendulum that we go back and forth on. Is it phonics based or whole language? And at the time when I was learning to read, it was definitely a whole language approach. And it was great for me. It worked. I love to read. I was a avid reader at a really young age. It came quickly to me. Um, I remember I have vivid memories of like standing on my tiptoes, reaching for those leveled readers books, but I was at the top level that I could barely reach at. However, when I think about my road, I can't help but think about my twin brother's road to reading and his was the exact opposite of mine. And so we were in kindergarten together. It was the only grade we were put together and after that they split us up but he had the exact opposite like he might have been able to like physically reach those high level books because he was taller than I was I am was at the time too uh, but he couldn't access those books it was a real struggle and I just remember the tears and the fights and going like taking him to tutoring and the little old ladies that tutored him. And I just have like these very strong memories in both of my own reading road and, and my brothers. And, and I don't know, I think that that may have spurred my, you know, want to become a literacy uh, expert um, and a teacher for sure. Um, but it's really hard for some kids and it's easy for others. And I think that in order to, you know, try and encourage your own children to become readers, you have to recognize where your bias might come from and understanding your own road. So I think taking that moment to reflect on yourself as a reader is important. So thank you for that. Um, this is something that you may be familiar with. Um, this is called Scarborough's Reading Rope in Scarborough Hill kind of, she, she was the one who came up with this diagram and you'll see different visuals that reference this. Um, I love this visual image um, or infographic uh, because of the colors. A lot of the visuals you'll see or copies of this are, are black and white. Um, but why I like it, not just because it's pretty, but because it really shows you the different strands of what reading really is. Reading is such a complex process that it's not as simple as like, just sound it out and you can read it. There certainly is a component of that. And so you can see that this is divided up into two main chunks. So the top is our word recognition and the bottom is our language comprehension. 
And I'll talk a little bit more about what specifically these terms mean, because I know not everyone is as familiar with them as say I am. <laughs> um, I live and breathe this stuff. So when we're talking about word recognition, we're talking about decoding, phonological awareness, and sight recognition. Some of these words are buzzwords you hear, you'll hear them at parent-teacher conferences, and you'll hear them when you're uh, you know, looking at their kids' dibble scores or their eye ready scores or whatever, but not everybody fully understands what this stuff means. Um, and so we're talking about decoding, we're talking about breaking words apart, um, and we're talking about sounding them out, recognizing what they mean. Um, phonological awareness is understanding the connection between the, the sounds and symbols and what, what that means. And sight recognition is that automaticity where we can see it and we just recognize it right away and can read quickly. We would call that fluency, that piece. Um, and then at the bottom part, we've got vocabulary knowledge and background knowledge and language structures and literacy knowledge and verbal reasoning. And that's kind of some higher level stuff, but that's that comprehension piece. So what is reading? It's comprised of these two things. And so I just kind of broke down Scarborough's rope into some simple phrases here. So we've got fluency, which we're talking about speed, accuracy, and expression. It means all three of those things. And what our students often and our children often think when we're talking about fluency is we're reading as fast as we possibly can, because that's what good readers do. And in reality, that's not what we do, right? We have to find the right speed, not too quickly and not too slowly. Accuracy is really reading the exact words that are on the page. Um, sometimes we skip around and we skip words or we skip the simple words is and the well we'll take those little articles and disregard them when we as fluent readers read that's sometimes what we do but when we're talking about our children and our students we don't want them to do that we want them to read with accuracy really read the words that are on the page and reading with expression and, and intonation is kind of two components so it's talking about whether or not we're recognizing that there's different speakers in a text so we're talking oh, this is turned in from like the teacher or, you know, this sort of otherworldly figure to a child or something. Recognizing those expressions and the tones would be different as well as paying attention to punctuation. And I find that to be really tricky with some of our um, struggling readers. So that would be pausing at commas or recognizing that a question mark we use up talk when we're asking a question. Um, so that's fluency is compact. It's not just one thing. When we're in parent teacher conferences, sometimes they'll say, oh, your kids fluency is improved. That there's a lot there. It's not just simple, simply fluency. And then we have comprehension, which is a little higher level task, but that's understanding and making connections and recalling. It's not just what was the kid's name. There's a lot there. Um, and good readers really do these things really well. They do them all together. Um, and that's kind of that end of the rope of Scarborough's rope where everything starts to get more tightly woven and it impacted together. And that's what a skilled reader profile would look like. Okay, this goes a little deeper into even understanding what does that take up? And we call these is the four reading processors. These are some really created by Marilyn Yeager Adams. And this is very cool. This kind of takes the rope and takes those key phrases we just came up with in the last slide and really shows it in another visual. The orthographic and the phonological processors are a foundation, and you can see that at the bottom of this triangle. Um, so an orthographic, what we're talking about there, that ortho there, we're talking about visual. What are we seeing? We're seeing where the letters and trying to make meaning that the letter has a purpose there. And you can think about this if you're learning another language that maybe uses characters that you're unfamiliar with, like Hebrew or Chinese, right? Those aren't letter. you can see that they're there, but for many of us, we don't automatically have a, a meaning for those markers. And then the phonological processor, that's auditory, phono, meaning hearing, auditory. So these two pieces need to be strong. This is a foundation. We have to have a strong foundation in order to become a skillful reader. Um, you can see that the arrows in this picture are going in every direction because we do all of these things all the time when we're reading. Um, if we have a student who's stuck or a child who's stuck at the orthographic graphic or phonological processor stage, oftentimes that's where we'll see our students who have dyslexia um, or another kind of reading-based learning challenge. Um, they're really kind of stuck in that piece where they're still trying to sound out those visual components and they're still trying to hear the different sounds. Um, 
That doesn't mean they can't get to the meaning making and contextual piece. They still can. In fact, you probably notice in your own children or, or uh, even adults that even if you can't read so fluently, sometimes your comprehension level is much higher. That is, that's typical too. Um, and so that meaning making process is really just taking the visual component and the auditory component and having an understanding of what that means, and then being able to put it in context. And that's really where we get to high level reading and um, really skilled reading. I broke this down even simpler. This is sort of what I call my own cheat sheet for what that depiction just meant. So the orthographic processor, again, on the left side, we're seeing the letters C, U, and P. Okay, we see those. Most of you, when you saw that, probably made a picture in your brain and you knew what that meant. To the right is the phonological processor. Those diagonal lines mean sound. So you can see I'm not purposefully spelling the word incorrectly. That K is indicative of the sound K. So you see now you see the word cup and you hear the sounds K, A, uh, P. And you're able to make meaning of it. And that's where that picture of the cup comes in. And then you're making even deeper contextual meaning and saying, mommy wants a cup of coffee. So really complex ideas can seem really simple, but the reason why I broke it down this way and really emphasize why we need to understand this is because reading is so complicated. It's not a simple task, even if it was for some of us when we were growing up, it seemed like it just happened to me automatically. I simply was able to read, but for many of us and many of our children, it's just not. And you can tell like there are so many things going into making this work. Um, I'll provide you with my slides. So this just kind of defines those processors a bit further. Um, I won't read this now, but um, if you are gonna go back to the slides, I definitely recommend looking this over a little bit more. And I'll share that again, you can go back another time. I do include a little bit of spelling here. I can't talk about reading without talking about spelling. And especially because many of my parents, my students' parents will ask me about spelling. Um, I, it's pretty obvious when your child is not a strong speller, you see it really quickly um, and it becomes really evident. So I, I just kind of wanted to show you that reading and spelling goes hand in hand. They need to be taught simultaneously um, because they are very similar things are happening. In fact, they're kind of like opposites. So when we're talking about reading, we're talking about decoding breaking things down into its smallest parts. And when we're talking about spelling, we're talking about encoding, which would be taking those small parts and putting them together. So they're kind of like opposites here. And you'll notice in this image, um, it's very similar to the processors. So if we look on the left-hand side under decoding, we have these letters we see, the I is showing you like you're looking at these letters, B, A, and T, and then you're breaking it down into the sounds, B, A, and you're hearing those different sounds, then you're able to put into some meaning, oh, bat. And then look at my contextual clues. I can either have an animal bat or a baseball bat, depending on what's happening in this, around this word in the sentence, I would know which meaning to use based on context. That's a lot going on. Some of us just kind of think, oh, I just read the word bat and I know what it means. But this is all the stuff that's actually happening in your brain at the same time. So if we have a breakdown in any of those points, of course, reading is going to be hard. Um, so spelling, I just wanted to, you to show a parallel diagram of like how really it's so similar, but opposite. So if you can look on the right hand side, the encoding piece, we have someone says the teacher, the parent says bat. The kiddo has to, in their brain, has to break that down into all of its smallest parts, b, a, t, and then has to think about what are all those sounds, what letter represents those sounds, and then they have to have this fine motor skill movement to be able to do it. It's a lot. There's a lot going on when we're talking about reading, and there's so much going on when we're talking about spelling, but they all happen together. Um, Spelling, learning, spelling tends to lag a tad behind reading. So it's not unusual to find a stronger reader and a weaker speller. That's pretty typical. I would say it's atypical to find a really strong speller who's weak at reading. Um, it can happen, certainly, but, but typically you would see it the opposite. Um, but I always say the more you read, the better you're going to spell. And it's, it's true, but there are so many things that can, can break down and can happen at that point. So reading and spelling should be taught simultaneously. 
Here's a few keywords or buzzwords that I think we hear all the time in parent teacher conferences or just talking to your kiddos teacher or to other parents. And I just want to make sure we're kind of on the same page about what these words mean. Decoding is really breaking down the letter, understanding the letter and the sound correspondence and how to how it helps pronounce words, right? So you can picture kind of breaking down each word. The phonological awareness, this is a term that's used a lot. Um, and it's really the foundation of reading. So it's, it's hugely important to understand. It's the ability to recognize and work with sounds in spoken language. So it's that phono, that auditory piece. It's really recognizing how to break words apart. Um, I'll do things, I'll ask a student, um, say the word bat, say the word bat, but take away the b. So they're not reading, they're not spelling, they're just listening for the sounds. Uh, that's a huge indicator on how uh, potential weakness in reading. So if you do this at an even younger age, I do this with my little kindergartner. I did it with him last year just to see if he could do it. He's a preschooler. He's not reading or writing yet. Um, and when I did this with him last year, it was really interesting because he could do it automatically. There was like no hesitation. He could take away sounds, input sounds, mix sounds up better than most of my students. Um, he doesn't have any diagnosed learning disability. Um, but it was really interesting that as a non-reader, he could do this really, really well. And I have other kiddos who are reading and they just, there was a major breakdown. They couldn't do this piece. It's hard for adults too. It's fun to do it with adults. Um, another word phonics um, used all the time. You'll hear it all the time. Um, a lot of the districts are implementing phonics based instruction. Um, so it's the relationship between the letters that are written and the sounds that they make, right? So if you notice that phonological awareness piece, that's all about the sounds that you're hearing and manipulating those sounds. And then phonics is recognizing the written letter and the sound relationship. Science of reading, this is also a huge buzzword right now um, in education, um, buzzwords, I should say. Um, and it really refers to the many, many years, 20 plus years of research that's been done by the cognitive scientists and reading experts. Um, Orton Gillingham, I guess I could have added that to this sheet too, but that is based off science of reading. Um, we use Orton Gillingham instruction at my school. It is, uh, I think it's being adopted into many of your, your districts as well right now. Okay, that's enough of my sort of research that I really find hugely important for reading. You have to understand a little bit about where reading comes from in order to engage your kiddo. So this might be kind of why you're here tonight. So you um, wanna know how to keep your kids engaged in reading over the summer. I think first and foremost, you need to create an atmosphere and environment that fosters reading instead of forcing and punishment. Now, I am not saying don't give incentives and don't do star charts or sticker charts and give ice cream. I am all about that kind of stuff. I think why not celebrate the hard work? Reading is hard. We just learned all about that. Um, but it needs to be come from a positive space. So forcing and, and punishment, you guys know as parents, is, doesn't really get you very far. So understanding motivation, I think, is huge. If your kiddo is um, intrinsically motivated, of course, this will become easier. If they are more extrinsically motivated, then certainly use some sticker charts. Um, the younger they are, the more extrinsically motivated they tend to be. I think understanding your kid's uh, motivation is huge. These are some tried and true things that I have found uh, work really well in my family, but also in the families that I, that I work with. I love, love, love using magazines. Um, my kids, both of them actually get monthly subscriptions to magazines. I know it might sound silly for my two-year-old. It's, he gets this sort of indestructible little book from Highlights Magazine and it's geared for uh, two to three-year-olds. And they're obviously, I read with them, but he, you know, and it even gives you instructions on what to do. like it tells you like pick out all the triangles on this page and look what the baby's doing. It gives you uh, other activities to do. So it kind of gives you a little lesson plans to do with them. Um, my oldest one gets a Ranger Rick magazine and loves it. And as soon as that comes in the mail, he is like, we are reading this before bed. So magazines are fun. Kids love receiving mail. Um, I'm all about getting monthly subscriptions. I also love going to bookstores. Um, I know you recently heard from the librarians, like go to the library, it's packed full of all these things in magazines, certainly, but I think magazines are great. There's 
even if the kids are just flipping through and looking at the pictures, you can encourage reading here and there, and they're just little snippets. And if it's something that they're interested in, whether it's sports or travel or kids like comic books, there's so many cool stuff in magazines. Um, something else, high interest, low level books. These are all links. So when you get my slides, you can click on all of these and it'll lead you to blogs and different things that I've used. Um, high interest, low level books. These are high school specific recommendations, but they can be used for anyone. And, and what that means, you might hear this term high interest, low level. And what that means is it'll give you the interest level of the kiddo. So this is high school interest level. And then the books are kind of written at more of a young adult, younger adult uh, reading level. So those are really great. Um, this leads me into my independent reading level because I strongly believe that kids should be reading if they're choice books or they're books for the summer that it should be read at their independent level. And what that means, like when kids are in school and they're learning, teachers teach at what we call an instructional level um, where it's challenging them a little bit. Now we never want to get to the frustration level um, because that would be too much. They're not going to learn when they're at frustration, but if we can kind of get there, like teachers will tend to kind of border that a little bit um, in order to get these kids to learn, but we don't want them to be struggling over the summer. If you're working, talking about engaging them in reading, it should be done at their independent level. I have this quick uh, five kind of five finger rule. Um, you may know this, this is something I use with my students, but it's really just pick kid picks up a book, bookstore, library, whatever, they open the book to any random page and they read it to themselves. If they get stuck on a word, they hold up one finger, get stuck on a number, another word, hold up one finger, stuck on another word, hold up one finger. If they get to five fingers, the book is too hard. It's not at their independent level. If they're at zero or one word, the book's a little easy. Not bad for summer reading. I think in fact, it's fine. But if it's at like, they've got two or three fingers up, I think it's perfect independent reading level book. And that's, you know, it's not always guaranteed gonna work that way, but I found it to be a really successful way. And it's, it's a way that kids can do it on their own too. You don't have to sit with them and tell them it's too hard or too easy. Let them figure it out on their own. I think that um, allows them to get invested as well. Audiobooks are big. Learning Ally, Bookshare, uh, all of our students at my school um, have, have access to this and in fact use it. We use it in our classroom, all of our classrooms. Um, I think they're fantastic for road trips and I've linked um, a list here that, um, yeah, they're just perfect for road trips and kind of all for full families. So young kids, adults, um, kind of engaging list. Um, books that turn into movies are always really fun. Our students love to do that even at our school. We'll, we often do that and we'll show the movie. Uh, you can certainly show the movie beforehand. It doesn't always have to be watched after. Watch it before. That'll give them that background knowledge and some of that vocabulary that they'll have when they get to the book. So they won't struggle as much. They'll already kind of understand a little bit about it. Or read it, read it and then watch it afterwards. And it allows for so much really cool conversation that maybe you aren't used to typically having with your kids which leads me to book clubs. Um, I think family book clubs are wonderful. And this is a list of books um, that I think are great also kind of for, for families. You can do them as read alouds or read them on your own depending on the age or um, abilities of your own children. Um, but family book clubs are great. It gives you, I don't know, sometimes these kids get into this middle school age where they don't wanna talk to you at all or maybe high school even. Um, and you just learn to talk about books like adults would talk about books. If we were all in a book club together, we would just have a casual conversation. Oh my gosh, can you believe what that character did? Or, well, was that how you pictured that going? Or what do you think would happen if there was a sequel? That's how real adults talk about books. So why not talk to your kiddos like you talk to everyone else? Um, I'm a big proponent in treating my students um, like equals when it comes to this sort of topic. And I think it goes far with them. Um, you know, you're really valuing what they have to say and showing them that you care. I think that's real big. So there's a list and you will have um, those provided, those links for you. Um, this is a question I get asked a lot. Like, how do you support your readers when they're at a low level, but they need to, to access higher level texts or concepts like at school? Um, and we talked a little bit about that 
high interest, low level, but sometimes kids have to just read something and it's maybe too hard. Um, I will keep going back to assistive technologies like Bookshare and Learning Ally. Um, they, it's, we call it reading through your ears. It's not a cheat. Um, I don't know how many times I have to try and convince parents that it's not, they're not cheating. Um, this is the way their brain works. We've known, um, and you know this probably even before my presentations that, you know, reading is really complex and it's, it's a brain thing. It's not an easy, quick visual piece. So, uh, you know, there's a lot of roadblocks there and the assistive technology really just helps a student access higher level stuff that they probably can get to. They just can't read it. Uh, read alouds are great. Even as parents, you can read aloud. Again, you're not cheating. Um, choral reading, what that refers to is like reading together at the same time, probably more appropriate for your younger kiddos. Um, but they read with you, not after you, but with you. And then partner reading. Uh, this is, I think, super common. I know a lot of uh, parents do this anyway, where I read a little bit, then you read, then I read, then you read. My one spin on that, instead of saying, hey, I'm gonna read this page, you read the next page, or I'll read this paragraph, you read the next paragraph. I take it, again, to kind of put the power in the kiddo a little bit, you read until you're ready, and then I'll read. And then you read until you're ready, and then I'll read. And if they read a sentence, they read a sentence. But slowly, the more um, confidence they get, they'll tend to read a little bit more. You'll be surprised how many really poor readers I'll have in my office that'll just keep reading and reading and reading, and they'll just struggle their way through it because they feel, they feel comfortable, like I'm not pushing them to read something they're not comfortable with. Um, and again, I just bring up this piece that like creating an atmosphere and an environment that fosters reading instead of forcing and making it punishment. I think it's really, really important. Um, and the last thing I'm gonna do, I'm gonna end with you like I end with my students. I'm gonna give you an exit ticket. Um, so this is helpful for me as a presenter and as an educator, but also, Again, it allows you a moment to reflect, but in the chat bar, if you don't mind um, writing down one takeaway from this evening. So maybe something you're gonna try, something new that you hadn't thought of that you'll wanna try or, or something new you just learned. Maybe something I brought up you hadn't learned before. Um, or, or any other questions or comments that come to mind that you were kind of thinking about that you wanted to, to jot down for a minute. So I'll give you a minute. You can write a little response in there for me would be awesome. Great, I love that. Yeah, trying a magazine. Bring Mickey over to the bookstore and go to Tattered Cover and let him peruse all those magazines and find something he wants to bring on your trip this summer. I love that. Yeah, Danae, I think just modeling for them is big. You know, my kiddos are five and two, so it's hard for me to find time that they see me reading. Um, but I do also try and find time during the day to read with them where it's not only at bedtime because I tend to be, I don't know, maybe not at my best then either. So I can model expression and enjoy <laughs> with reading during the day when I have a little bit more energy in me too. Well, thank you guys so much. I do wanna open this for, up for questions if there are any. Um, I did leave my contact information. So if you want to send me an email about anything further, I'd be more than happy to respond. And um, again, you'll have my slides, but my last slide is just a couple of additional resources that have really wonderful information if you'd like to go to. So thank you so much. Yeah, you're muted. Thank you, Danae. Um, thank you to our presenter, Jessica, Denver Academy and Developmental Pathways. Just a reminder, you will be receiving uh, an evaluation after this presentation. We would appreciate it if you would just take a few minutes to complete that. Provide your feedback as we're always trying to improve peak services. 
Are there any questions before we end? I, uh, I put one in the chat. Yeah. Um, just that I, I meet a lot of parents um, whose kids weren't identified with reading issues. Actually, I meet some at, at our school, but, um, and um, I'm just like, what, what signs do you recommend that parents look for that you might want to get a reading evaluation? Sure, early on, I mean, really early reading skills or skills I should say that lead to, tend to lead to um, reading challenges later on would be inability to rhyme, hearing rhymes, understanding rhymes. Um, and that's a quick one. I mean, I do that with my two-year-old too. Um, sweet and feet. And, you know, and then I said, does that, does that rhyme? And we do those back and forth or, um, so rhyming, I think is important. And then again, like that phonological awareness piece that I was mentioning before, and the, like, I can do that, you know, with really little kids then also, um, where it's just, you know, say bat, but take out the t say hat, but instead of hat say, b. can you take out the h and put in a b? and my son, Elliot can do these things. You can do it with harder, more complex words. Um, I'm trying to think. Um, those are two of like the largest indicators. Nadine Gab has done an incredible amount of research on early um, indicators for uh, dyslexia and other reading-based learning challenges. And she's really pushed even for toddlers. Um, I think she created an app even that toddlers can do that can depict it. So we are really, research is like so strong right now into finding reading based learning challenges earlier and earlier. But Nadine Gab's work has been tremendous on this. Thank you very much. And then I would also just reference in you know my last slide here with the understood.org is an incredible resource. Um, they have a ton of really simple to read infographics and on all things ADHD, dyscalculia, all kinds of learning-based uh, challenges. Uh, really simple website, easy to follow, easy to understand. And then the IDA.org, and even more specifically, the Rocky Mountain branch. Um, I was on their board of directors for many, many years um, and stepped down when I had a couple of kids because it took a lot of time. But the IDA RMB branch, you can also find it at rmbida.org. Um, tons of resources there, even you know lists of tutors and psychoeducational evaluators and all of that kind of stuff there. And then the Florida Center for Reading Research has really wonderful games, easy stuff to incorporate. Their website's a little harder to navigate, but if you can, it's it's pretty good there. Wonderful. Well, thank you all for attending. And if you have any other questions, please contact any parent advisor at PEAK, www.peakparent.org, 719-531-9400, or parent advisor at peakparent.org. Here's Jessica's information. And just please check our PEAK website for upcoming webinars and trainings.